Good morning, King of the Nations. Welcome to our online service this beautiful Sunday morning, July 7th. Uh, as you know, uh, construction has begun at Gaithersburg High School, where we usually meet for the entire month of July. So that's why we're online this morning. And starting next weekend, we're going to, to do uh, Saturday evening services. So that's starting July 13th, 20th, and 27th. We're gonna be doing Saturday evening services at seven o'clock here at our uh, Darnstown Road location. Um, so we're excited to see you guys next week for that. Um, we will have translation. Uh, but we will not have kids ministry. So just keep that in mind as you're making your plans. Um, these Saturday night services will be live streamed. So if you can't make it in person, uh, they will be available for you um, online. Um, and just during this month of July where our routine's a little bit disrupted, we want to make sure we're um, staying connected. Uh, and one of the ways we can do that is through the summer pop-up dinners. So um, the summer pop-up dinners are uh, these dinners that people are having at their homes and you can just go online and um, look at all the dinners that are available, pick one, and it's a great way to sort of make a new connection, uh, meet some people uh, in the congregation that you might not have an opportunity otherwise to get to know. So these dinners are really fun, they're really popular, so we just encourage you to look online and see what's available, pick one, and just, you know, go for it, meet some new people. Um, we also have, happening this month, The Art of Marriage, um, so that is a, a, a a two evening event, one evening in July and one in August, and that's for couples. That's for couples who are dating, uh, engaged, or married, no matter how long. Um, and they have new material this time. So if you've taken the art of marriage in the past and you really benefited from it, you can actually take it again because it's all new, all new stuff. Um, so uh, you're going to want to um, go online for that and register for that. And the way that you can find sort of these sign up links is there is a link in the description of this video if you're on. YouTube. Uh, you can also find the link in um, the links to both these summer pop-ups and um, art of marriage in the link in our bio on Instagram or you can just find it on our website. Um, uh, we also want to just encourage you guys um, to just continue with um, the offerings this month. Uh, just a reminder that the, there's ways online you can give your offering to the Lord. Um, uh, you can go on our website kingofthenations.org. Uh, you can text to give to the text to give number. We also take Cash App. Uh, and of course, you can mail in a check if you're old school like that. So we just want to um, encourage you to continue with that. And uh, without further ado, I, I get have the um, opportunity to uh, introduce our speaker for this morning. We have the privilege of hearing from our own executive director, Art Hayes, who is going to be bringing the word of God to us this morning. Art? Hi, my name is Art Hayes, and I'm the executive director here at King of the Nations. And it's my privilege to be able to continue our series in 1 John called Authentic Love. And tonight, we'll be looking at uh, chapter 2. And so, uh, before we start, I'm just going to relay a little story uh, uh, happened when I was in college. I was uh, attending a church across the street from the college. And we had a uh, Wednesday night meeting that happened every week. And we had dinner. It was really nice. And we were at this Wednesday night meeting. Uh, and one night, I think we were having kind of a business meeting or something. And an older woman, my age, <laughs> stood up and, uh, and spoke. And I can't remember exactly what her point was, but she uh, included this in what she was saying. She said, I'm just really thankful that for the past 10 years, I haven't committed a sin. Golly, the silence after she said that was deafening in that room. And uh, I think that what we were all thinking was, wow, uh, that's probably hasn't been my experience and uh, I think I heard someone else say, well, she just broke her streak because when she proclaimed that, she was moving in pride. <laughs> but in any case, uh, this is very appropriate for the second chapter in the book of First John. If we look at this, uh, we find at the end of chapter 1, 
this in verse 8. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Then as we move into chapter 2 and look at verse 1, it says this. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. And so maybe this woman, it's theoretically possible, I, I guess, that she hadn't sinned in 10 years. But that certainly wasn't the experience of anyone else in the room. And what John is talking about here in uh, chapter 2 is what happens when Christians sin. And so the title uh, of this message is being a Christian and not sinning from uh, 1 John chapter 2. And let's just start with prayer. Dear Lord, I just pray that you would bless this word and it, your, my words would be what you want spoken and uh, you would uh, enable everyone to hear what you want to speak to them through this message. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, as Pastor Greg said last week in the first message of this series, John, the disciple at this point, is older. He's very wise at this point in his life. He's seen a lot. He's writing, he says in verse 12, to young men, to children, to fathers, to the strong. I believe he's basically writing to everyone at this point everyone at any point in their Christian walk. And what he really wants to address, as he said, I write this so that you will not sin, he wants to talk about what happens when Christians sin. And he's not talking about really uh, uh, tiny little sins occasionally happening every now and then. I think what he's really talking about is what happens if a Christian has sort of uh, an area of their life where they're sinning, where they can't get victory, where there's uh, sort of uh, an area which uh, troubles them and bothers them. And John is really wants to speak from his experience to help all different people in different uh, times of their walks, whether they're young men, children, fathers, whether they're strong, whether they're weak, everyone at this point in their Christian life. And so he wants to give us the wisdom he has accumulated over many years. He not only walked with Jesus, uh, he has seen so much over his ministry. Uh, I think he's in his late, uh, well, probably 80s or later at this point in his life. And he wants to probably just distill what he's learned uh, down to the basic essentials that he feels will help Christians uh, to walk in a life where they have full victory and they're not sinning. And so what is the first point that John brings up here? And I think if, if we look at this passage at the beginning of chapter 2, what he's really trying to say is, who or what do you know? Let's take a look at this passage where he says, we know that we have come to know Jesus, him, if we keep his commands. In other words, if we're walking with him and not sinning. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar. And the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. And you know, there was a time in John's uh, life when he was walking with Jesus, and uh, Jesus was in the area north of Jerusalem in an area that was called Samaria. And uh, this was an area that they had to walk through to go from Jerusalem to where Jesus was born. And at this point, he, Jesus was sitting by a well in the heat of the day. It was noon. His disciples, most of them, had gone to find food. And uh, a Samaritan woman uh, came up, and Jesus started talking to her. And this is actually the longest recorded conversation in the Bible that Jesus had with someone. 
And John is the only disciple who wrote this about this. So this meant a lot to John. Something about this interaction Jesus had with the Samaritan really stuck with John throughout his entire life. It probably really impacted him. And I feel it's appropriate to this idea of being a Christian and not sinning because I feel that woman at the well 2,000 years ago represents many people today. Same way of thinking, same way of, of looking at things. So let's just take a quick look at this. When, when uh, Jesus was sitting at the well, the Samaritan woman came to, to draw water for herself. And Jesus said, can you give me some of the water that you're drawing? Can you give me a drink? And she said, you are a Jew and I'm a Samaritan. Uh, usually Jews don't have anything to do with us. And so it was immediately apparent to her that something unusual was happening because she would be expect any Jew to totally ignore her. So they started talking. And this conversation is recorded in uh, the book of John in the fourth chapter. And so at one point in the conversation, she was talking to Jesus and it was going back and forth. And Jesus just kind of flat out told her, he said this, you Samaritans worship what you do not know. And I think that that's sort of true of a lot of people today. They have certain ideas about what Jesus is, who Jesus is, and what Christianity is, but they don't really know Jesus. They don't really know a lot. They just have bits and pieces, but it's not fully there. Even if they are really sincere, if they don't really know who Jesus is and what the Bible says and what Christianity means, she, just like the Samaritan woman, Jesus said, you have a lot of ideas floating around and some of them are good, but really the problem is you don't know what you worship. And you see, there's a difference between knowing information about someone and knowing someone themselves. John is saying here that we must know Jesus the person. And this is why we say we have a relationship with our Savior. If we continue to look at this conversation the Samaritan woman had with Jesus in verse 25, the woman said, I know that Messiah called the Christ is coming, and when he comes, he will explain everything to us. And then Jesus just broke through everything she was saying and said, I know. The one who am speaking to you right now, I am the Messiah. And you see, this is what a lot of people need today. Even though they might have a lot of ideas, even though they might have uh, bits and pieces, if they don't have the full picture, and John is saying, if you don't know Jesus, then it's hard to live for him. It's hard to live for what you don't understand and don't fully know. So the question becomes, how can we know Jesus that way? And well, the Bible. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all wrote what Jesus said and did while on earth from the beginning of his ministry till the end. It's all there. You see, everything is there for us to learn and read about. If we really want to know Jesus, the information is not hard to get. It's all in the Bible. And I believe that these disciples understood how important it was for people to know Jesus. And so they wanted to write an account. John, as he's saying right here, uh, if you want to walk with Jesus and, and keep his commandments, then you have to know him. It says that right in verse 3. We know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. And so... The question is, how do we know Jesus? Well, knowing Jesus takes effort. You know, there are people who read manuals and there are people who don't read manuals. And I think it's kind of funny because I'm the kind of person who reads manuals. I love to read manuals. And so a lot of times people will go, well, I just don't need to do that. I can go ahead and put something together and uh, I don't really have to get out the manual." And of course, if you go to Ikea and buy some furniture, this is what's going to happen if that is you. After the thing is put together, and it may not be perfectly straight, it may kind of wobble a little and so forth, there are probably going to be five or six screws that are still in the package, that are still there. 
And of course you think, <clears throat> maybe those screws are just extra screws, but they're probably not. They probably needed to be screwed in somewhere to make that thing really stable and work. And because you didn't read the manual, you missed it. And so it does take some effort to learn about Jesus in order to come to know Jesus. It's all there. The disciples left all the information. But the question is, are we willing to read it? Are we willing to uh, get that information and, and, and learn more about him. In other words, is whatever we build going to wobble and have a few screws, screws missing? Or, or is it going to be solid and, and something that we can uh, rely on? John also says knowing Jesus is a process. As we continue to keep his commands and walk with him, I believe as we learn more about Jesus and we learn more about what it means to walk with him, and then we actually do that, then it kind of feeds back on itself and we learn even more about him and then we're able to walk even more with him. So it's not something that happens like that. We're saved like that. In other words, we're changed from death to life and we are born again like that. But conforming our life to the pattern of Jesus is a process. And so uh, one day, yes, Maybe we'll be like this woman who stood up and said, I thank the Lord that I haven't sinned in 10 years. But that's not been my experience, and I think I'm as old as she was at that time. It's still a process for me. And the Holy Spirit works in us, and God is a good father, and he understands that it's a process. So if we're willing to take the next step, if we're willing to learn some more about Jesus, if we're willing to know him in a deeper way, and in, and in, in a way that's taking us further than we've been before, then I believe that w our behavior will conform more to, uh, to what he wants, and uh, we'll be actually pleasing him more and sinning less. So step one is we have to know him. Who or what do you know? I think what John would tell us next is who or what do you love? He says this in verse, eight, in verse uh, 15 of chapter 2. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, then love for the Father is not in them. That's kind of interesting. He's saying these two things are kind of contradictory. It's either going to be one or the other, not both and. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, comes not from the Father but from the world. The world and all its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. And, you know, this is, this is a really difficult area as we walk out of Christian life. How do, how do we handle that? Uh, the world is bad. God is good. Well, it's not really that simple. And uh, we know we're not supposed to love the world, but we can see a lot of things in the world uh, that are the result of God's working and his handiwork, I think we can like, we can appreciate, we can respect, we can even marvel at God's creation and the things of the world that aren't wrong or evil. But there's sort of a line we can cross when we go farther than that and we start to love the world. Uh, and then once we get into this area of loving something, what we'll find is our behavior changes. It's interesting that what we love sort of will determine our behavior. If we love righteousness, then our behavior will be righteous. If we love evil and the things of the world, that's what our behavior will be. You know, we can, we can like, we can appreciate things. I think Jesus appreciated things. I think he appreciated uh, good food when he made the wine at the wedding in Cana. It was excellent wine. I think he appreciated the amazing perfume that was poured over his feet. I think he could appreciate certain things. We can appreciate uh, things in the world, but when it crosses over into love, then it, it becomes a problem. What, what you love determines your behavior. And I just want to tell you a story real quick. Uh, when I was deeply in love with my wife, Debbie, 
but she was not actually in love with me at that time. I was uh, firmly in what's called the friend zone, but I was very grateful at that point to even be in the friend zone. <laughs> and so I remember what I would do is uh, two or three times a week, I would go to Starbucks and get uh, some coffee for me and some coffee for her. And then I'd drive over to where she worked during her break and she would come out and sit with me in the car for a few minutes and drink coffee and we'd talk. And you may think, gosh, that's a lot of effort, you know, two or three times a week, you're making sure you go to Starbucks, you get the order, and then you drive all the way to her work, and you wait there, and then she comes out, and uh, just for a few minutes of sitting with her in the car while you're drinking coffee. But that's what happens when you love something. Whatever you love is going to turn into behavior. There's no choice about it. Whatever you love determines your behavior. And so when you love the world and the things of the world, well, when we love the wrong things, such as money or fame or power, then that's going to determine our behavior. And the results, the fruits in our life will be lust, pride, sin, things like that. But if we love the right things, if we love God, if we love his kingdom, then it's going to be much easier for us to walk in the way he wants us to because that love will determine our behavior. Uh, I just want to give an example real quick. Um, uh, you know, let's say you get a new car. Wow, you are so happy you have that new car. And for the first couple of months, uh, you know, you probably go out and look at it. You probably sit in it even though you're not driving it. If you see any spots anywhere on it, you probably get a rag and you, and, you, and, you, and you wipe it off. You probably go to the car wash three or four times uh, in those first three months, whereas, you know, five years later, you're lucky to go to the car wash twice a year. And so you really, you really <laughs> appreciate that car. And uh, what happens if for some reason there's sort of a ding or a dent? that gets put in that car. It really hurts. It really affects you. And I think that's really what John's trying to say here. When we love God, when the love of God is in us, as John says, and we love his kingdom, when we either see sin or we sin ourselves, uh, it's just like the dent that happens in that brand new car. That's the way it feels to us. And so John is saying, if you really want to, to, to walk in a way pleasing to God, you have to look at what you love. Because if you don't change what you love, then you're not going to be able to uh, have your behavior be what God wants it to be. And so John kind of finishes this little part of chapter 2, and he talks about really the nitty-gritty of love. He says, anyone who claims to be in the light, or in other words, walking with God, but hates a brother or a sister is still in the darkness. As we said, those things can't coexist. You can't love the world and God at the same time. Anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light, and there is nothing in them to make them stumble. So John's trying to sort of give a concrete example, just as I did with the car. He's talking about our brothers and sisters, our neighbors, our friends. And he's saying, if you hate them, then there's a problem. You really uh, don't have the love of God and the kingdom there because God sent his only son uh, to die on the cross so that uh, mankind would be saved and reconciled to him, everyone. And, uh, and he's, it's, 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 if he sees us hating our brother or a sister when he loves them, that's just not compatible. And so John would say, let's take a look. If you're having trouble with sin in your life, just take a deep look at what you love. Where is your love? And if you love the world or anything in the world, you have to realize that that is going to produce behavior that's contradictory to what uh, the behavior is if you love God. Love determines behavior. It just happens. We can't avoid it. It, 
It's just the way we're wired. So the first point today is who or what do you know? And the second point is who or what do you love? And I think the third point that John would make to us is who or what is truth for you and your life. John says this. You have an anointing as a Christian from the Holy One. I believe what he's talking to is about is the Holy Spirit who dwells inside of us. And all of you know the truth because Jesus is the truth. I do not write to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it and because no lie comes from the truth. So the truth is an integral aspect to John and all of this. In fact, uh, Jesus at one time said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so there has to be a sense where we can appreciate, understand, and realize what is true if we are going to live our lives in a way pleasing to God. Let me just relate a story that happened to me in college again. And if you've taken the next class here at church, you've heard me say this story, so please bear with me. But I was in our uh, college uh, Christian group, and I was having uh, a debate with someone in that group one night. We were going back and forth, making our points. I can't actually remember what we were debating about, but I do remember this. I finally thought I'd won the debate. I'd won the argument, and I said this point, which I thought would just win it. There would be no way he could answer. So I said it, and I was kind of proud of myself. I thought, well, this is, that's it. I've, you know, this point is the best point that could possibly be made. And my friend kind of stopped and he paused and he looked at me and he said, Art, that's a great point, but it's not in the Bible. And I remember exactly what I said after that. It rolled off my tongue. I said, it must be in the Bible because I know it's true. And right after I said that, something inside me kind of said, are you sure about that? Uh, That's not quite right. And so I was thinking that, and then my friend kind of backed up his chair a little bit more and looked at me, and he said, Art, I'm really not sure you're a Christian. Wow. That, that hurt. But there's a proverb that says, wounds from a friend can be trusted. If they really love you, then wounds from a friend can actually be something that will help you. And so I really took that to heart after he said that, and I thought to myself, what happened there? I made a point, and then he said it wasn't in the Bible, and what I was thinking, I sort of replayed this, I pressed rewind and play, and I thought, what I must have been thinking was, it had to be in the Bible because I know it's true. And whatever I think is true, the Bible must correspond to what I think. And then I thought, well, that's not really the way it works, is it? If, if the Bible is the truth, then uh, what's really happening is probably that sometimes I don't have a full understanding or I am making a mistake. I need to conform to what the Bible says rather than me being certain, absolute, always right, and the Bible needs to conform to me. And so, you know, after that, I started thinking some more about this, and I thought, hmm, even though I've grown up with the Bible and reading it and everything else, uh, Sunday school all my life, I decided I would go back to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which are the accounts of Jesus' life that we mentioned before. Uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John wrote what Jesus said and did while on earth from beginning to end. And so I went back. And I got a yellow legal pad and I started reading those books again. And I read them and I read them and I just at the same time asked the Holy Spirit, show me something, show me what I need to know about this. And the Holy Spirit did. And lo and behold, I found some other things that I thought were true, but were not in the Bible. And so at this point, I just surrendered and I said, you know what? You... The Bible is what's true. Jesus is what's true. And so the question I would ask someone is, is truth relative? 
In other words, are there all kinds of truths? As long as this person believes something and this person believes something and this person believes something, then it's true for them. In other words, truth is relative. Truth depends on who believes it. Is that the way the world works? Or is there one truth, one absolute truth that everything one day will have to conform to? And I think that what the Bible says, I know what the Bible says, is that's the case. You see, Jesus, when he was before Pilate, told Pilate that he came into the world to testify to the truth. In other words, Jesus was the one who would tell people what the truth really is. And Pilate answered, he just kind of scoffed. And he said, what is truth? Because Pilate was locked into a world where truth is relative. Pilate judged people all the time. And he saw people who, who had their own ideas about the truth. And so Jesus said, there is one truth. And I am the one who testifies to this truth. In fact, Jesus went even further and said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And so I had to make a decision at that point. I had to say, you know, I have to listen to the Holy Spirit. And if I think something is true, but the Bible contradicts that, and the Holy Spirit testifies to that, then I have to change if I am say I'm a follower of Jesus. And that was an important sort of growth point in my life in college when the Bible became more authoritative over my life. And I started to look at things and say, am I submitting to the truth that Jesus testifies to? There's absolute truth. There's one truth. Truth is not relative. So I want to go back to the woman at the well. And Jesus was dealing with someone at the well where truth was relative. And we find people like this all the time uh, today where truth is relative. And so I think the way Jesus sort of approached this is kind of interesting because what the woman was doing was she was deflecting the truth. And so when people think truth is relative and truth means something for them and they have their own truth and then Somehow or another, they encounter or you speak to them the absolute truth that Jesus testifies, the truth we find in the Bible. They have to choose. They can either receive that or not. And if they don't, they deflect it. As the truth comes in, they just, nope, it's going to go on this side. Nope, it's going to go on that side. And so at one point, Jesus told the woman, go get your husband. And the woman said, I don't have a husband. And Jesus said, well, that's actually kind of true because you've had five husbands and the one you're with right now is not your husband. And then all of a sudden, this woman realized truth was standing before her. Truth was talking to her. And she couldn't quite handle it at this point. And so what she said was this. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you're a prophet. Now, you know, let's talk about some theological things. Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain where we stand. But you Jews, you have a different approach and you claim the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. You see what she's doing is she's deflecting. And have you ever talked to someone and you made a point that you know God wanted you to say and the Holy Spirit wanted you to say to this person, but then they deflect it. They won't let it come in. They're holding on to their relative truth. And that's what this woman did at this point. When Jesus told her that she uh, had five husbands and she realized that truth was standing before her, she said, I think I'll just, I won't let this get any deeper into my life. Why don't we start discussing theology? And why don't we start discussing the fine points of this and the fine points of that? And so that's a way we deflect. And then at the very end of the conversation, she deflected again. Jesus had really been speaking truth, and I'm sure she was getting pretty uncomfortable. And finally, she just wanted to sort of deflect the input she was getting from Jesus. And she said this, I know that the Messiah is coming. When he comes, yeah, then I'll accept what he says. He will explain everything. But until then, yeah, I'm happy just living with the way I think and so forth. And then Jesus declared to her, I the one speaking to you, I am he. And that finally broke. That finally broke through. 
And I wish I knew when I was, and when I'm talking to people like this who are deflecting and deflecting the truth, I wish I knew exactly how to break through like that. A lot of times it happens, sometimes it doesn't. But whatever way we're going to break through, there's no other way than Jesus. Just being Jesus to them. Because the way Jesus broke through with the Samaritan woman is he said, I am the one you're talking about. And so when we're trying to break through and when it's whatever we're saying is being deflected, just remember that if we can just somehow or another present Jesus and be Jesus to them, that probably has the best chance of reaching them. You know, today with the internet and social media, everyone claims they testify to the truth. Everyone says, believe me. That's the way influencers operate. And we talked about that in a previous message series. They're saying, I have truth. I have something you need to know. You should believe me. And there's so much going on where people are telling uh, things that are not true and not accurate and not real today. With the internet, there's so much information. And so it, it's really hard. But fortunately, with things that are eternal, with things that matter, there's no ambiguity. There's, there's no uh, uh, confusion. Because Jesus said, I am the truth. I testify to the truth. You will find the truth in the Bible. And you can be sure of that. So what I think John is trying to do here is he's just trying to give his experience over his life, distilling it down to three things to help Christians uh, who may want to have victory over a certain area in their life. He's not condemning Christians. He's, he's, he's really, I think, being fatherly. John is being fatherly to this. And so the first thing he says is, who or what do you know? Make sure you can look at this. John would say, we must know Jesus. So the issue may be is you just need to know Jesus better. You need to just get in the Bible, get in the Word, talk to people, uh, and so forth, and just make sure that you don't you can uh, you you know Jesus uh, as best you can at that particular time. And I believe that since it's a process, Jesus reveals more of Himself to us as time goes by. The second thing John would say is simply this: Who or what do you love? John would say that the love of God. And what God loves must be in us. And so if there's anything that has crept in that is contradictory to the love of God, if we are loving, now I'm not saying appreciating or respecting or uh, uh, enjoying or things like that, things that are good, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about this deep love. If we've decided to love things that God uh, sees in the world that are bad, the, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and so forth. If something like that has crept in and we're just not willing to let go of it, then that's going to be a block and is going to cause behavior that is sinful and that uh, we'll have a hard time getting victory over until we deal with what, uh, where exactly why that love is in us that shouldn't be there. And that love needs to be... Uh, uh, love of godly things and his kingdom. And the third thing John would say to us, who or what is the truth for you? Is truth relative? John would say Jesus and the witness of the Holy Spirit inside us is the truth. You know, when Pilate, uh, when Jesus was before Pilate and he said, I came here to testify to the truth, and Pilate said, what is truth? The only person who wrote that was John. It really impacted John. And so I think that in some way, John chapter 2 is reflecting things he learned over the course of his life and learned watching Jesus. Who or what do you know? Who or what do you love? And who or what is the truth? And he saw this played out in the story of the Samaritan woman, and that stuck with him. So uh, I would just like to conclude tonight and uh, just uh, have a uh, pray. Dear Lord, please speak to anyone here uh, that this is, is something that they need to focus on in their life, uh, something that, uh, where they need to, to learn to know you more, uh, learn, uh, look at what they love, 
and, and really sort of have an idea of, of where the truth is. Are there areas where they still are holding on to their own idea or version of the truth or if they surrender to you? I pray your Holy Spirit would speak gently and speak uh, authoritatively to every person who hears this message and might be in that position. And your grace would be poured out upon them. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you very much. Mm-hmm.